So I finally played Infinite Warfare, and it's one of the most confusing games I've ever played. Because this futuristic Call of Duty game took me back to how this series used to work. Kind of. Traditional game reviews have structured their coverage of Call of Duty as a primarily single-player shooter that happens to feature a multiplayer mode. That made sense in the old days, but after Modern Warfare 2, it's never really added up. My first video deliberately focused on campaign to discuss how Call of Duty's gameplay went from vulnerable common soldier to one-man badassery, and that the latter clashes with elements designed for the former. Were I in the position of a consumer advisor, Modern Warfare 3 through Black Ops 3 would be viewed under the lens of a multiplayer experience, as it's where the developers apply most of their attention. But Infinite Warfare is the first modern Call of Duty game I felt the need to address as a single-player game first. And due to the sharp contrast between its campaign and online modes, Infinity Ward's latest is among the most fascinating they've put together. Though that's not to be confused with their best. Because for every strive the game makes to bring Call of Duty back to the benchmark it used to be, Infinite Warfare beats itself back down. To start, what's made gameplay more enjoyable is the genuine pacing and dynamic utilities. For even my favorite entry in the series, Call of Duty has always been relentless. Rarely is there ever an equivalent of the post-battle exploration of Half-Life 2 or a ladder in MGS3. For as memorable as a nuclear explosion might be, a silent infiltration is just as important for creating tension, menace, and investment. That pacing is a large contributor to why Call of Duty 4's campaign is as fondly remembered as it is. So in the opening hours of Infinite Warfare, what had me shocked was after blowing up robots, buildings, and spaceships, that another explosion wasn't used to transition between loading screens, but instead entering your character's office and being left alone in pure ambience. It was magnificent. Being able to take a breather after the constant running, shouting, and shooting. For once, the campaign feels like an immersive adventure rather than just a series of levels slapped together closer to an album rather than a greatest hits collection. There's a fluidity and elegance from mission to mission that was sorely lacking in Ghosts. That game had a concerning symptom since, I'd argue Black Ops 2, of introducing one-note mechanics, instructing you on how to use them, and then never bringing them back, effectively reducing these sections to glorified quick-time events. Here, not only has the contrast from Modern Warfare made a return, but gameplay elements are more open this time. The ability to hack synthetics isn't something restricted to a single level, it's something that can be utilized at any point during combat, at the whims of your own creativity rather than Infinity Wards. Your spaceship isn't used for an on-rail set piece, but something that is visited frequently throughout the game. At times, I found myself being legitimately immersed in the experience, though that may also be due to the characters. To be fair, I haven't played Black Ops 3 yet, but Advanced Warfare went from merely having cardboard cutouts to people I legitimately despised. From press X to pay respects to look at our Russian babe Polygon praises for being so badass, she gets the shit kicked out of her by a wounded non-exosuit bandit. Infinite Warfare's heroes are varied in personality and ability, but all are believable and grounded. Their sarcasm is realistic and not penned like a Joss Whedon imitation. They have connections that grow over the game, and they're strong, not by being superheroes, but by struggling with loss and regret, but rising to the occasion regardless. Even the side characters have their own personality and charm, making the pilots, privates, and gunnery chiefs memorable, and making your home base feel lived in, like a tangible place instead of a level select screen. Which is why it's disappointing when the story gives these characters nothing to do in relevance to the plot. And this is where we get into Infinite Warfare's problems, nearly all of which are remnants of old designs that have been retooled to fit Call of Duty's modern gameplay and setting. The most obvious of which is found in the game's opening, that being the sheer amount of time spent following people, which doesn't even add up for story reasons that will be discussed. At nearly every stage in this game, you'll be following someone else as they tell you what to do, where to go, and what to look out for. Similar to a teacher narrating a textbook in class, or yours truly reading a list of games off endlessly, none of this sticks with you, the participant. Tension isn't felt in levels during these prevalent sections because nothing is attached to the player's actions. You can moonwalk behind these NPCs, have a seizure, or put the controller away to fold laundry, and nothing comes of it. Call of Duty 2 had NPCs that you followed, but levels were packed with enemies on all sides and many were vast and wide open areas you could progress through in a multitude of ways. The NPCs existed for the player to fall back on, and to never get lost during the chaos of battle. 
Infinite Warfare rarely has this. Act 1 has a great section on Earth that is the closest this game gets to Call of Duty's 2 and 4, where you're pushing towards a tower with multiple friendlies and enemies in sight, and Act 3 has a similar event on Mars. But outside of those, the game is relatively small in scale when it comes to combat. I've previously discussed an issue in games like Battlefield 1, of using regenerating health and weak enemies, but without the chaos in battle to justify either, devolving gameplay into nothing more than centering your screen and clicking, which can be accomplished with your desktop. Previous Call of Duties have suffered heavily from this, but Infinite Warfare's efforts to solve this problem are commendable and sometimes effective. Featuring multiple enemy types that can't just be taken care of instantly does a good job of making you feel like an underdog. But the small levels, lack of options in progression, and constantly following NPCs that would make a mother lose patience prevent Infinite Warfare from feeling very, well, infinite. It took me far too long to find a suitable answer as to why the intensity that used to be Call of Duty's staple has lost its way after Modern Warfare 3. But Infinite Warfare revealed it. The frame rate really struggles in the more intense sections of this game, at least on Xbox. It's able to keep at 60 FPS when fighting indoors against a dozen enemies, but when the battlegrounds open up, performance is all over the place. I don't equate Modern Warfare 2 and 3's battlefields to the same standards as earlier CODs due to the stupidity of Russia invading all of America and Europe simultaneously, but it was impressive on hardware as outdated as the Xbox 360 and PS3, and it had a spectacle that was entertaining in its absurdity. To have Call of Duty's campaigns devolve into corridor crawls is a BLT without any bacon and no amount of tweaking the formula and adding enjoyable features such as a hacking module is going to mask that Call of Duty's old designs simply don't fit its modern style. This next section contains spoilers for the story campaign. If you'd like to avoid these, skip to this point in the video. Final warning in 3, 2, 1. Following your NPCs throughout your journey makes even less sense considering the story where by Act 1, your character Nick Reyes is in command of a spaceship and its crew. Yet as far as this goes for your actions as a player, you pick missions, and that's as far as the correlation goes. I understand that soldiers wouldn't put their captain on the front lines, and that the game is already taking a leap with Reyes entering battle at all, but that's not exactly what's happening here. Your fellow soldiers tell you what to do, and you do it, just like when you were a rookie in Modern Warfare. But that's the least of this story's problems. The greatest is the plot and its structure. The game's opening is to set up a full-scale war that sparked between the mars base SDF and the earth base UNSA. While the prologue bores, the invasion is actually solid, establishing the overwhelming power of the SDF without simply blowing up your home on a lame set piece. However, when these missions are completed, the war is set and your admiral is investigating some specific details into the finale of that first act. But when the game is nearing its conclusion in Act 3, your Admiral has got the data necessary, and this makes everything you do in between completely useless. There's no point in saving plants, destroying enemy ships, or gathering resources. Your problems are solved by someone else off screen. This leaves a likable cast nothing to do except die at the end, and all of the development they built up over the course of the game could have been accomplished with the premise of them running a bar on Earth. There are some nice touches, such as the game's theme of sacrifice, watching the news after each major level, checking audio logs, hearing letters during the credits, and there's even a touching moment when you need to apply pressure to a soldier's wound, assuring him that things are going to be okay, as you slowly feel his heartbeat through the controller's vibration fade away. Death quotes are even back, this time being related to the SDF. It's interesting to have your mistakes be emphasized by the enemy's ideology and military supremacy. Yet without these quotes, the SDF would have no characterization. During that first piece of quiet time I mentioned in your office, there's a whiteboard full of SDF's most wanted members, from Small Fry to the main antagonist. This had me oozing excitement. The possibility of gathering intel, hunting down and exterminating the SDF's most essential members one by one, had flashbacks to the flexibility of Crackdown or the subtle character buildup in Thief or Assassin's Creed. This was going to be great until discovering that you just stumble upon these people during missions with no buildup or payoff. You do see a picture and learn what they look like after you've already killed them. Why is this a thing? Because if it didn't exist, a few of the side missions would have next to nothing in reward for the player. Fun fact, when writing this part of the video, I legitimately forgot to bring up the villain. 
That's the level of charisma on display here. It's by no means just that the actor is miscast, because no actor in existence could make this villain seem threatening when all he does is send you messages and dies. Again, for as monumentally absurd as the Modern Warfare games got, its villains actively fought against our heroes, killing allies and foiling our plans, making it all mean at least something when you press RB to throw a knife into their eye socket. Even the game's conclusion suffers from this unrealized potential. Multiple members of your crew sacrifice themselves so you can continue, but so many of the deaths are predictable and contrived. The lack of an epilogue is really felt here, with nothing but Nora honoring her comrades while a loudspeaker confirms, yes, your mission was a success. It neither commits fully to its theme and leaves a player as lost as their character in the end, nor does it wrap up the adventure in a satisfying way. Yet, for all of the issues with Infinite Warfare, its campaign doesn't elicit the immense frustration I felt in previous outings. Because there's an actual experience to be had here with effort put into it by a slew of people from the artists, actors, designers, and more. I get the sense when playing that Infinity Ward were passionate about their creation. And that's what was really missing from Ghosts. But what about multiplayer? Well, the amount of passion in this mode is so inescapable, I've struggled to come up with anything to say about it for three days. As I've said in previous videos, it's the Black Ops 3 what World of War was to Modern Warfare, except that game had a drastic shift in setting. Levels were war-torn Europe and Japanese islands rather than Afghanistan or Russia. Gore heightened the chaos, as did violent modes like war. Meanwhile, Infinite Warfare is the fifth game in a row to progress further into the future, and it's the third game in a row to use enhanced mobility, yet it doesn't remedy any issues from previous games, to the point where talking about Call of Duty's general issues rather than Infinite Warfare's component on its own is more interesting to discuss. Number 1 I've got nothing against iron sights in games, but from day one, I've never understood why you're required to aim down sights when your enemy is close enough to read your weapon's serial number. In Call of Duty 2, it was to prevent automatics from being dominant in the selection that mostly consisted of rifles, and Call of Duty 4 did it to promote the perk system. But as the series has progressed, it's gotten more absurd. To give players enhanced mobility but force them to ADS in almost every scenario utterly contradicts the game's flow. It's neither realistic nor logical with the game's mechanics. Medal of Honor and Bad Company proved years ago that you can have a relatively accurate hipfire for close range combat and not break the game in half. Number 2 I learned from my Battlefield 1 coverage that there's quite a few players that enjoy having a large list of weapons to pursue, and while I don't share this feeling, I can empathize. To someone who enjoys their selection of games rather than a maniac like myself who's got a worryingly large list of them, more unlocks is a good thing. But my issue with this system isn't having a selection, it's that the amount of choice is an illusion. No matter how large a selection is, people are going to choose their personal favorite and nothing else, or what's objectively the most powerful. Despite all of Infinite Warfare's guns, there's four that are prevalent in every mode and map. While it's true that players can intentionally change up their classes and experiment with every weapon in the selection, what would be better is a system that gives a compelling and legitimate reason to use all of its selection, rather than just for the sake of maintaining our sanity. Number 3. You cannot have both. Infinite Warfare in particular seems to be afraid of its own mechanics. You have the capabilities of climbing multiple stories or wall running until nightfall, but the maps are designed to prevent you from doing so. Invisible walls are littered like New York trash, and walls designed for the running mechanic often have objects that limit you to entering at a certain height. In fairness, the developers have found themselves in a no-win scenario. Call of Duty Ghost was burned alive for its changes to level design, so the developers stick with the old formula, but said formula needs to be compatible with the game's new abilities, so they add elevated jumps or walls to run. Except now the player can reach locations they were never supposed to, so walls are designed to set you down a strict path, and every elevated jump has a ceiling to keep the player contained in the map, neutering the advanced mobility in the process. It's a paradox that can only be escaped by giving into one side, expanding the maps, or cutting mobility. And we know which choice Sledgehammer has made. 4. Infinite Warfare is the worst offender of this, but it's been evident since Ghosts. For as much as developers aim to retain Call of Duty's core gameplay, one only needs to look at Modern Warfare's kill cams to see a big shift. The amount of clutter is unprecedented, with nearly all being minor traits and bonuses, designed as such to not affect the gameplay too much, but made in order to add something new. 
I can only speak for myself, but customizing a Call of Duty used to be as easy as breathing. Tweaking your classes while chatting with friends in Black Ops was easy and fun. Now to make a big adjustment in a lobby requires planning and exact knowledge of which menu to navigate and use. When the customization is too vast and vapid for your own pre-game lobby, it's time to dial back your additions. As I said in the beginning, Infinite Warfare is one of the strangest games I've played in a while. It's a multiplayer game where its developers seemingly didn't want it to be, based on the effort in single player compared to multiplayer. I can't speak for the developers' intentions, as there's little to no information on this game's development. It can only be theorized. Thankfully, their intentions have resulted in a much improved game from the perspective of campaign, and I would recommend giving it a try in the event of finding a cheap copy. That is, if you've already played Titanfall and Doom. It's a brilliant example of when a studio should be investing their time into something new, but can't due to the profit margins of their current work being too large for a publisher to turn down. From the setting and technology to the structure and pacing, there's so much potential to really take Infinity War to a level that put them back among the greats. But what undoes all of it is the name to which they must uphold. A quick update, I am currently in the process of moving, so it's likely the next video will take longer to produce. Least favorite video game of all time. Tactical Tactics by Derek Smart. Derek Smart, Derek Smart, Derek Smart! How many goats are you worth? Less than one. Who do you think would win in a fight to the death? General Grievous or 12,000 rogue chickens trained in the arts of a Jedi Knight, led by a chicken who is dressed up as Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. These are the important questions the Star Wars prequels should have answered, but definitely the latter. What is your favorite Paramore song? What's Paramore? What's the best part of living in BC? No fucking snow! Favorite dildo? This one. 